Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Herodotus Herodotu, who is a PhD student who is wrapping up his PhD at uh, Duke University. Uh, Hero has done some really good work uh, in the area of query optimization, his, in sort of tuning SQL queries, and now more recently on tuning MapReduce programs. So today he's going to talk about um, his work on the self-tuning system for big data analytics. All right, thank you. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, so today I'll be talking about Starfish. Uh, that's a project that we started at Duke. I guess I started about two years ago. Ever since, now it has grown. Uh, I'm now leading a team of four or five students that are actually uh, working on uh, enhancing Starfish in different directions. We've already even started exploring some uh, opportunities and some collaborations with uh, some other universities. So clearly, it's a very big project. But for today's talk, I'm only going to focus on the, uh, the work that I have done related to Starfish. All right. <laughs> So it's actually, it's, it's a very good area. Uh, it's a very good time to be working in the area of data analytics. Uh, I've been to a lot of talks over the last six months or so, where a lot of people from you know, architecture, systems, machine learning, they're motivating their work on how the, the data sizes just keep growing and growing uh, exponentially. And based on uh, some IDC reports, some very recent report, the amount of data that's going to get managed in the various data warehouses over the next decade is going to grow 50 times. Right? And the, the amount of hardware itself, the cluster sizes, will also grow 10 times. Right? So data sizes are really, really growing. However, the, the number of people, the IT staff, the administrators, who are actually managing uh, and tuning these particular uh, clusters, it's only going to slightly grow by 1.5x. So clearly, you know, the same amount of people that we have today are going to be asked to manage and tune much, much larger clusters with a lot, a lot more data than they do today. So it's very timely that we are considering uh, ways of automating the process of managing and tuning the cluster, making it very easy for the users to actually uh, tune the clusters. Right? Then this is exactly where Starfish comes into play. The idea behind Starfish is to provide uh, this ease of management and good performance, automatic good performance uh, out of a system for big data analytics. Now, when I started working on Starfish uh, a couple of years back, I wanted to figure out and really think about what are the kind of features that data practitioners would like or require even from a system on big data analytics. Right? Sisters, uh, users would like a system to be uh, magnetic. That is, they would like to be able to just simply load their data uh, in whatever format, structure, semi-structure, unstructured data, and the system should be able to handle that and you should be able to analyze any kinds of, uh, of data. Of course, the system would also should be uh, agile, right? Uh, data changes, the type of analysis that users want to run on top of those data also changes, so the system should be able to handle uh, changes uh, very easily. The type of analysis that people would like to do uh, can be very complex, could be very simple to very, very complex. You might want to do some machine learning, some statistical analysis, uh, some text analytics, etc. And of course, different people for different analysis would like to use different kind of interfaces. And of course, those kind of interfaces usually make more sense. If you want to do some statistical analysis, you might want to use something like R, uh, which is a statistical software. Or if you want to do some business analytics, then you're more users are more comfortable with something like SQL. Right? So it would be nice if a system can actually support all these different types of interfaces. Uh, data lifecycle awareness is also another very important aspect today. People are tr starting putting together uh, these big systems that consist of various components. You have the user-facing uh, systems that are uh, serving the users, then you have some uh, log aggregation systems, and then finally some 
analysis system, so the data will flow through the whole pipeline. The system should be aware of that pipeline to make sure that everything goes smoothly and uh, the system behaves with good performance. Elasticity, of course, uh, nowadays is also very important, especially with uh, how cloud is becoming very popular. People could now uh, have run a system on the cloud and they would like the system to be elastic in the sense that we should be able to add more resources or take out resources from the system itself. And then robustness, of course, you know, it's almost a given. Uh, the system should be robust. Uh, it should degrade gracefully in case any types of different failures uh, would happen. So these uh, six main features in some ways form what we call the matter principles. Right? So these are the principles that govern data analytics systems uh, today. Now if we take a look into these this matter uh, principles, in some ways they're really targeted targeted in making the systems easier to use, right? Users should just be able to just load the data, run my analytics. I don't need to do any complicated uh, ETLs or any crazy transformations to get things to work. So it's very easy to use. However, you know, if you have a system that's really, really easy to use, it's very hard to get good performance out of it automatically, right? And that's in some ways it's a consequence of the principles themselves. Uh, if you have a system that can uh, uh, be used to analyze structured or unstructured data, that means that now it creates challenges like, for example, uh, a lot of the, uh, the users are now have to rely on uh, high level, using higher level uh, languages in order to uh, do all the complicated analysis that they would like to do over these uh, semi-structured and unstructured data. They want to write their UDFs to customly parse the data and then customly analyze the data, uh, etc. Now, like I said, say, keep saying this, you know, semi-structured and unstructured data, that means that the system doesn't really know what this data is, right? We're moving away from the good old uh, relational world where the system knows, okay, this is the schema, these are the statistics, not anymore. The system doesn't know this information. Right? So it's very hard for the system to figure out the best thing to do in order to have uh, good performance. And then finally, if we look at some of the, uh, uh, these uh, properties like elasticity, right? if you take a system like Hadoop, and I'm going to talk about a lot of Hadoop in a little bit, uh, it is elastic. You could add five nodes to the system and the system will pick it up and things will work. And that's wonderful. However, how do you decide whether you should add five nodes or not. Maybe you should add 10, maybe you shouldn't add any, right? How do you come up with the right kinds of policies uh, in order to automate this process and make sure you're doing the right thing, right? So there's a lot of challenges that are involved here. So uh, our goal for Starfish from the get-go was to try and get a good balance between ease of use and getting good performance automatically. And this is something that's going to come out in the talk as I, as I go on. Right? We're not interested in getting the absolutely best performance out of the system. It's all about getting good performance in an automated way. Right. So currently, uh, we have, well, actually, two years ago, we've uh, selected to build the Starfish system on top of Hadoop mainly because it already satisfies a lot of those matter principles. It can handle unstructured data, uh, it can run all sorts of different types of analysis, it's elastic, etc. So we decided to build Starfish on top of Hadoop. Now analyzing data in Hadoop usually involves loading your data, a lot of times as simple files, into the distributed file system, and then running parallel MapReduce computations on top of that to interpret and process uh, the data itself. Now, over the years, there's a lot of systems that have been built on top and around uh, ha uh, uh, Hadoop, creating an entire ecosystem, uh, mainly to satisfy different users' needs and preferences, right? So there's a lot of uh, systems on the side, there's Flume, there's, it's a log aggregation system, there's HBase, it's like a key value store on top of Hadoop. Uh, on the top, there's a lot of uh, 
systems like Pig and Hive that offer more declarative languages, more higher level languages that uh, users can use for uh, expressing the computations that they would like to do for the type of analysis they would like to do. Uh, Amazon is offering uh, Hadoop now as a service on, uh, on their cloud. So customers could say, hey, I would like to get a 20 node Hadoop cluster to do something. All right. Now, if we look at this entire ecosystem, there's actually a lot of what I'm going to call a tuning problems, a lot of tuning challenges that we can address, ranging all the way down from you know, the cluster itself. How do we decide what kind of machines do we want? How many uh, nodes do we want to put together to put this cluster together? Uh, then going up, right? we have a distributed file system. I'm going to lay down the data. How do we decide how to lay out the data? Uh, both the original data and the derived data that's going to be generated uh, from the different uh, computations we're doing. Uh, then moving up, we're going to be running MapReduce jobs, right? MapReduce jobs, uh, their execution is influenced by a lot of different configuration parameters. So how do we tune all those parameters to get good performance out of it? Now moving on into some of the, uh, the higher system, higher level systems like Pig or Hive uh, that in some ways that generate workflows of MapReduce jobs. Uh, now, you don't have individual MapReduce jobs anymore. You have graphs of MapReduce jobs that are running together to achieve a particular graph. And then finally, you, know, you have overall workloads. You're running on the cloud. So you have a, a new set of challenges that you need to, uh, to address. All right. So uh, in this talk, first, I wanna, I'm going to talk about what Starfish can actually do today. What are the kind of features and what are the capabilities of the Starfish system? So these are going to be the high level, the what Starfish can do. And then I'm going to go into more details on the how Starfish can actually do all the things uh, that it can do today. And I'm, for the uh, interest of time, I'm only going to focus on tuning individuals, individual MapReduce jobs. But of course, more challenges about workloads and workflows and cluster sizing problems will come through. And uh, I can talk more about it uh, if you guys like uh, later on. And then I'm going to finish off with uh, some experimental evaluation and some brief mentions of some related work. Right. So let me start about what Starfish can do today. So what I'm going to present next is a set of uh, experiments in some ways that uh, we've I've run uh, that in some ways will showcase how Starfish can be used to manage MapReduce workloads on the Amazon EC2 cloud. Now, there's nothing specific about you know, Amazon EC2 here. You know, everything could work on in-house clusters as well. Amazon EC2 was uh, simply a convenience for us to create different kinds of scenarios in varying uh, the cluster that we're using. Uh, now, for people who are not very familiar with Amazon uh, uh, EC2, the uh, what Amazon has is a set of different machines, uh, different instance types the users can rent, about, I think, 11. Uh, and I have a table outlining some of the, uh, the more popular ones. Uh, so the users could rent machines of any type to put together a cluster. Now, if we look at this table, different machine types, of course, have different machine specifications. If I were to focus on the C1.medium, uh, a machine of the C1 medium type has five EC2 units, uh, whatever that means, has 1.7 gigs of memory. It can offer moderate I.O. performance, and it will cost 17 cents per hour to rent one of these machines. Yes? Do they ever say what moderate I.O. performance means? No. They do not <coughs> quantify uh, what it means. And also, they don't really quantify the EC2 units, which in some ways, uh, complicates things for users because now you know I'm a user, I know my workload, but if I don't know exactly what the machines are, how do I decide which machine should I be using? Right? Uh, again, stressing out the need for some tool or Starfish in this sense to actually tell us, hey, this is what you should do. Right? Uh, and then apart from clusters, we also vary uh, the workload. Now, I tried to select 
uh, MapReduce programs that come from all sorts of different domains ranging from business analytics to graph processing to information retrieval. And then the data sets that I used uh, were both real and synthetic with sizes ranging from tens of gigabytes up to terabytes. And of course, adding to this table are more traditional benchmarks out there like the TPCH benchmark, uh, the, uh, the Yahoo's Pick Mix benchmark, there's a high performance benchmarks uh, that I've played with those uh, as well. Right. So starting from the basics, right? you're running, you want to run a single MapReduce job on the cluster, on your Hadoop cluster. If you take that job, if you take Hadoop as is and that job as is and you're going to run it, you're going to get some performance. Now, like I said earlier, there's a lot of different configuration parameters uh, that you can use that will actually affect the performance of that particular job. So what this graph shows is actually the performance uh, when running these different MapReduce jobs that I've shown in the table before outlined on the, on the x-axis uh, of the graph as we run them using three different configuration settings. Now the blue bar shows the, um, the speed up. The, the blue bar represents the jobs running using the default uh, MapReduce settings. And the graph is normalized on actually the default settings. So of course, everything here is one. Now, uh, Hadoop experts and very uh, expert users, mainly from Yahoo or Cloudera, who have uh, a lot of expertise into using Hadoop, have published a lot of rules of thumb what we call rules of thumb. Think about this as these are best practices on how to actually set different configuration parameters in order to get good performance out of the system. Now, I went through uh, all that, uh, all those blogs and the different tutorials, et cetera, figure out uh, the different which different rules I should apply to different jobs, essentially manually tune every single uh, job. Right? And the red bars here shows the speed up that I was able to achieve after following all these different rules of thumb compared to the uh, default settings. Now, as you can see, we can clearly get really, really good uh, performance out of it. We can get speed ups up to you know, 30, 20 to 30x speed ups by following these rules, which is wonderful, it's great. Um, however, the one thing that is not really shown in this graph is all the, the effort and the time that I put into figuring out which rules should be used uh, for different programs. A lot of those rules are also kind of qualitative. Things like, okay, if your MapReduce program is not memory intensive and you could do partial aggregation, then you should set some memory buffers to be high. Okay. That's a rule of thumb. Right? As you see, that's you know, it really depends on the program. That means I, I need to understand what the program is doing. Uh, it I also need to understand what the different settings mean in order to be able to set them, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it was a very labor-intensive, time-intensive exercise to figuring out how to set these rules of thumb in order to get these uh, good speedups. The final bar, the green bar here, shows the speed up that we're able to achieve after using Starfish to automatically tell us what configuration settings to use. And as you can see, in all the cases, Starfish was able to automatically give us settings that would match all the rules of thumb and in some cases even surpass uh, the performance that we're able to get with all these rules of thumb. And again, I didn't have to spend any time in figuring out what rules to use or how to use them. Right. Now, of course, a lot of times people don't just submit individual MapReduce jobs. They'll submit entire workflows of MapReduce jobs, either themselves or they're going to be generated by higher level systems like Pig or Hive. Uh, at this point, Starfish is also able to support uh, tuning peak ladding scripts, which is the, uh, the scripts used by the uh, peak system. 
So what you see here is two graphs. Uh, on the x-axis, there are different queries from two different benchmarks, the TPCH and the uh, Hive Performance Benchmark. Uh, and these graphs show now the speed up with regards to uh, rules of thumb. I, I stopped using the default settings clearly. You know, they're performing pretty poorly. In some cases, you can't even use them anymore because some of the programs will not even run using the default settings. Uh, and again, in all cases, as you can see from the green bar, uh, the Starfish optimizer was able to give settings that will match or surpass the manually tuned settings that we're able to achieve um, for the different uh, MapReduce jobs here. Now, another very interesting scenario that uh, arises in a lot of companies is the presence of two types of clusters usually. There's, you know, all companies will have development clusters and they'll have production clusters. You know, all the mission critical workloads will run on the production cluster, usually well isolated. And then there are a bunch of development clusters where the, the developers can actually test uh, their, uh, the different MapReduce jobs they're developing, figure out how they work, uh, figure out that they work correctly, and then they want to move them on to the production clusters when the jobs are ready. Now, there are two questions that arise naturally uh, in this setting. First is, OK, I have seen how my jobs behave on the development cluster. So now, how will this job behave once I stage them over on the production cluster? And the second, even more critical question is, what settings should I be using for running these jobs on the production cluster? Now, one of the capabilities that Starfish has today is after observing how the jobs behave on the development cluster, Starfish can actually answer both of these questions uh, without ever running uh, the jobs on the production clusters themselves. Right? So this graph uh, shows the running time of, again, our different MapReduce programs uh, the blue bar shows the actual running time. This is how much time it took to run these MapReduce programs on the production cluster itself. And then the red bar shows the predicted running time. This is how much time Starfish predicted uh, that these jobs will take when we run them on the production cluster. Now, a few things to note here is that uh, Starfish was able to make these predictions without ever running any of these jobs on the production cluster. It observed how the jobs behave on the development cluster, which in this particular case consisted of 10 large nodes. Um, and the, the jobs were processing about 60 gigabytes of input each. Whereas the production cluster was actually a much bigger, uh, much beefier cluster consisting of 30 extra large nodes. And the jobs were processing now much larger uh, data. So Starfish, after observing how jobs behave on a small cluster on small amounts of data, was actually able to predict how the, the same jobs would behave on a much bigger cluster processing a lot more data. Now, uh, the other thing to notice here, one of the important things that I want to bring out here is uh, the accuracy of these predictions you know, there are, some of them are pretty close, some of them not so much. But the important thing is that we're, actually, we're able to get the different uh, trends together. And we're able to do that, then we can actually optimize uh, the individual MapReduce jobs later on. Yes? How strongly did the uh, run times on the production cluster um, relate to the run times that you saw on the development cluster? What do you mean? Basically, I'm, I'm asking about correlation. This is just a question of, of finding a so the simplest model could be okay. I take a simple linear factor. I scale everything. Ah, up, yes. Okay. Uh, so the answer is uh, I see what the the question is. Uh, actually, let me simplify that question. So let's say we had we ran two jobs on the development cluster, and we saw job one was running much faster than job two. Would that still be the case? in the production cluster, would I just say, OK, this is a three times bigger cluster. Multiply the running time by three. Would that still be the case? 
Uh, the answer is no. Uh, there's a lot more things in play here. Uh, you, yeah, you have more nodes to run your processing, though, more data. Uh, it is just, things are just too complicated to be able to do that linear scale up. Uh, and there are even cases that I've seen where uh, one job might be running a little faster on the devel development cluster, but then for one reason or the other, it would run worse on the production cluster, et cetera. Right. And then uh, the final scenario uh, that really arises with the cloud is the following. Suppose we have a user that wants to execute uh, a MapReduce workload, and of course there are some performance requirements uh, that come along with it. For example, they might want to you know, do some report generation and they want to finish within two hours uh, before you know, the morning or something. And a lot of times they may have also some actual dollar amount because you know, we're using the cloud, we're actually paying uh, money to use the cloud. Uh, so there might be some monetary uh, goal there as well. So now in these settings, there is a range, a different range of decisions that the user has to make, ranging all the way down from the cluster itself, right? The user now needs to figure out, okay, how many nodes should I use? What kind of type of nodes should I use to put my cluster together, et cetera? And then once I put the cluster together, I want to run Hadoop, there's a bunch of different settings that I need to figure out, you know, how many slots should I use? You know, what different memory settings should I use for Hadoop, et cetera. Excuse me. And then finally, you know, these workloads are going to run. We need to figure out, okay, how many map and reduce tasks should we run? Again, there are different memory related parameters. Should I use compression? All sorts of different parameters that we need to set. So as we see now, the range of decisions grows even uh, larger. There's a lot more decisions to make. Again, Starfish can actually help into answering, uh, making these kind of decisions for the users themselves. Right? So to summarize, there are tuning levels at all sorts of different levels, job level, workload level, cluster level, etc. So these are the different kind of tuning challenges and tuning problems that Starfish is able to uh, resolve today. Now, a lot of these, you know, tuning uh, challenges or tuning problems, if you like, you know, they have different flavors in some ways. Uh, but when we started putting uh, Starfish together, we really wanted to figure out some sort of a universal approach uh, that would allow us to actually solve all these problems in a nice unified way. Now, the way I was actually able uh, to achieve that was to take, you know, it's a, a unified approach into tuning. And this unified approach will be summarized in this particular slide, right? So the first, what we wanted to do was to observe how the job behaves and learn from it, right? And that's the responsibility of a component that we call the profiler. So the profile the profiler is responsible for collecting uh, concise summaries of how different MapReduce jobs are executed on different clusters and learn from it. Right. Then this information will be used from a different component, which we call the what if engine, that can actually estimate the impact that different hypothetical changes can have uh, to the job execution itself. So we can now phrase questions to the system of the form, okay, I have observed how this job behaves running 10, map re 10 reduce tasks on a 20 node cluster. Right? How will it change, how will the performance change if I were to run 20 reduce tasks in 10, instead of 10? How will it change if I were to add three more nodes into my cluster? Right? What if I now have a bigger data set? How will that uh, affect the performance. Right? So the what if engine is responsible for answering these kind of questions. And then finally, uh, for the different problems, you can think about, um, you know, there's a lot of different decisions that we have, we can make, right? So there's a search space to search through. And for that, we have a set of optimizers. The optimizers are responsible for enumerating and searching through the decision space to figure out what's the best uh, decision to make 
to get good performance and to satisfy the user's uh, performance requirements. So now I'm going to go uh, a lot into, uh, into a lot more details uh, regarding the profiler, the what-if engine, and the optimizer from the aspect of tuning individual MapReduce jobs. Right. Now, the way that uh, we view a MapReduce job is the following. We view it as a, a quadruplet consisting of the actual MapReduce program that's going to run on the cluster, uh, the data properties of the data that's going to get processed by this program, the particular cluster resources that we have, and then finally the different configuration settings. Now running a MapReduce job on a Hadoop cluster essentially involves running individual map and reduce tasks. The map tasks are going to process uh, partitions of the data, which are called splits, uh, to produce some intermediate output that's going to get transferred or shuffled into the reduced tasks. The reduced tasks are then going to process the intermediate data to produce the final output. And depending on the resources and how big the cluster is, this map or reduced task could actually run in multiple waves. Now, what affects uh, the execution of each map and reduce task is a set of configuration parameters. These configurations determine how many map and reduce tasks I'm running, uh, determines how do I want to partition the data, how do I set different memory-related parameters to buffer you know, map output or the reduce input, uh, should I use compression of this intermediate data or the output data, should I use the combiner that's a local pre-aggregation function that can be applied at the map output, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a fairly large space of different configuration settings that can actually affect uh, the performance of MapReduce jobs. Now at this point, the, you know, a, a typical question that might arise is, you know, how much do these different configuration settings actually affect the performance of individual MapReduce jobs? Now the answer is, well the true answer is it, it really depends on the program itself and the cluster and the data, but they can actually have a significant impact on performance in different ways for different programs. So now what you see uh, in this graph is uh, on the, uh, the x and the y axis we see two particular configuration parameters, that's the i.sort.mb and the i.sort the record of percent. These are two parameters uh, that affect the, the memory buffer that used for the map output. So on the z-axis, we see the actual running time of a particular program. It's a, in particular, it was a work coherence map reduce program that was run on a 16-node uh, cluster on EC2. Uh, so we see how this performance varies as we vary these two configuration parameters. Right. So we see there are some areas, this, the blue areas, where the, uh, the job performs very well. We get really good performance out of it. Uh, then we see some other areas, the red areas, where we actually get some really bad performance uh, out of the job itself. Right. So it is our job to figure out how do we get settings that are in the blue region and definitely far, far away from uh, the red region itself. So this is just you know, a two-dimensional projection of the surface. Uh, back when I actually generated this graph, I generated a lot of these graphs with different configuration parameter settings, got all sorts of crazy different uh, shapes and forms. But all these uh, surfaces, in some ways, uh, can be mathematically can be represented as a function. And it is a function of the program, the data, the resources, and the configurations. Right? So all these four things together are um, affecting the performance of the MapReduce job. And then you can use uh, essentially pretty much any performance metrics that uh, you would like from resource consumption to total execution time, et cetera. Uh, for simplicity, let's now think about performance as the total running of the job. Right? So when we're asked to optimize that is to find the optimal settings 
that will minimize the MapReduce jobs. Essentially involves into figuring out, okay, which settings should I use to minimize this function f. Right? The, you know, in theory, all is well. Uh, however, the main challenge here is that these MapReduce jobs, in many cases, are actually expressed as MapReduce programs written in high-level languages like Java or Python or generated by some systems like Pig or Hive. Right? So how do we capture the, the execution of the job? How do we represent these different programs written in these arbitrary languages? And the answer to that is profiles, job profiles. So a job profile is uh, the abstraction that I'm using to represent uh, the execution of my produced job. Right? So think about this. At the end of the day, this is a vector of features that characterize how individual map and reduce task executed on the cluster itself. And it records very detailed information at the level of task faces. And when I say task faces, I mean really subtasks, subtask faces, right? Like I said earlier, MapReduce job will run as map tasks and reduce tasks. Now, within every map or reduce task, we can actually break down the execution into various smaller steps. For example, for a map task, first, we need to read the input split from the distributed file system. Then we need to execute the user-defined map function uh, to produce some output. That output is going to get serialized and partitioned into a memory buffer. The memory buffer gets uh, filled up. Then we actually need to spill that to disk. Before spilling, we're going to sort it. If there's a combiner, we're going to use it. If there's compression, uh, if compression is enabled, again, we're also going to use it. Uh, so that might actually lead to the creation of multiple uh, spills. And then finally, we'll need to merge it to produce the final output that's going to get shuffled to the reduced task. And there's a similar thing that goes on for uh, the reduced task. Right. Now, by using this information in the job profiles, uh, we can actually uh, analyze the execution of MapReduce jobs uh, and understand how it actually behaved. So what you see in this, uh, in this screenshot here is a screenshot from the Surface Visualizer, a graphical user interface that we have uh, that the user can use to understand how the jobs behave. So what you see here is uh, for every different node, uh, you can see the, the black box is representing individual map tasks uh, that run, and the purple boxes actually represent reduced tasks. So we can quickly visualize all the, the map and reduce waves and how they execute it on the cluster. Now all that information is available to us from the job profile itself. Now there are two main dimensions uh, in the job profile. There is one set of data flow fields and there's one set of cost fields. The data flow fields represents the flow of data through the different map and reduced task phases. Right? So these are things like how much uh, records and uh, how many records and how much bytes did they go into the map task and came out of the map tasks. Uh, how many spills do we do? How many merge runs do we do, et cetera? Uh, for the people who are familiar to Hadoop, this is a superset of the Hadoop counters. Right? So it's a lot of information that represents how the data went from the different uh, subtask phases. And that information, and actually, before I go there, and then the second dimension is the costs. This represents, uh, for the most part, timings of how much time was spent executing the different task phases within individual uh, map and reduce tasks. Like, how much time did we spend performing I.O. versus how much time do we spend doing CPU processing of the user-defined map function. Now, all this information, if we collect this information from all the map and reduce tasks, we don't just have you know, single numbers here. We actually have entire distributions of these values. And then we can use those distributions 
to actually build uh, more meaningful and more uh, insightful uh, representations like histograms, for example. By looking at the output produced by the different uh, MapReduce tasks, we can build a histogram that will tell us you know, how much data were output by the different MapReduce tasks. So we can see if there was any skew involved, if there were any bottlenecks that would potentially create any bottlenecks in the execution, et cetera. And then with the, the costing information, we can actually break down the execution of individual map uh, and reduce tasks. So we can see how much time was spent in the different phases. And again, perhaps identify that, OK, so in this particular case, the spill phase, that's the phase where we actually you know, sort and spill to disk, took a significantly long uh, chunk of this you know, map execution. So perhaps there's something we could do there. Maybe there's some configuration settings we can uh, change there in order to figure out uh, uh, how to decrease the execution time of uh, the map task. Now generating these profiles uh, comes in actually two ways. We, one is we can actually measure uh, how the, uh, we can actually measure these fields, and this is done by the profiler itself, and this is how we can generate the job profile, or we can estimate a job profile, and this is actually done by the WADIF engine. And I'm going to go into uh, both uh, approaches in a little bit. Now, when it comes to the, uh, the measure, measurement-based profile, right? this is where the MapReduce job is actually running on the cluster, and now we want to observe what happened. Right? When I started putting together the, uh, the profiler, you know, I had some goals in mind. First of all, I should be able to turn profiling on and off dynamically. Right? So when I turn it off, there should be zero overhead on the, on the cluster itself, mm -hmm. which is something that essentially required, especially if we're running on, a, on the production cluster. And then on demand can turn it on and observe and learn from uh, how the job behaved with some low overhead. Uh, the second requirement, uh, well, second and third in some ways, had to do with how usable uh, Starfish is going to be or was going to be. Uh, the first one is we didn't want to uh, modify Hadoop in any way. And we also did not want to require the users to modify their MapReduce programs in any ways. Right? So in some ways, we wanted to increase the, the chances for Starfish to be adopted. Uh, and that's definitely something that was proven to be very wise, I guess, at this point, because people have actually started looking into Starfish and started using Starfish. Right. Now, the way that I was able to achieve all these goals in terms of profiling is by using a technique called dynamic instrumentation. Uh, so dynamic instrumentation is a technique that uh, has become very popular in programming languages and in the compiler world to monitor and uh, debug, in some ways, complex systems. So we took this approach here as well. Now, individual map and reduce tasks are running into uh, Java virtual machines, JVMs. Right? Now, what dynamic instrumentation allows us to do once we enable it in some ways is to actually tap in into these Java virtual machines uh, and dynamically inject bytecode based on some event condition action rules. That is, if an event happens, let's say a method gets called, right, and a condition is met, then a particular action needs to be taken. Now, that action in most cases has to do with you know, recording you know, the content of some variable or doing some fine-grained timings to collect all that information. So when we enable profiling, we dynamically uh, instrument uh, Hadoop Java classes to collect this raw monitoring data. That raw monitoring data will then get collected post-processed in some ways to build these individual map and reduce profiles that are then going to get combined together to build job profiles, which is what we're going to use later on for analyzing and optimizing the execution of map reduce jobs. Now, of course, 
when you're running MapReduce in large scale, you're running a MapReduce job that could actually have hundreds or even thousands uh, of map and reduce tasks, uh, there's really no need to profile every single one of them. So therefore, we have enabled some sampling features uh, into Starfish. The first one uh, is to use sampling to profile fewer tasks. If we have 1,000 map tasks running, we could profile 10% of those map tasks, and we're going to collect enough information to build a very accurate job profiles. And the reason, of course, behind sampling is to decrease the amount of overhead on the job execution even further. Uh, now, if I only want to run this job to collect some profiling information very quickly, because let's say I want to run this large ad hoc job, and I just want to get some information very quickly, then we don't even really need to run all those you know, 1,000 tasks. We can actually execute fewer tasks so we can get uh, approx build approximate job profiles very, very quickly that we can then use to optimize the execution of the job. All right. So what this abstraction, what this job profiles enables us to achieve is, in some ways, we're able to represent any arbitrary MapReduce jobs by using this you know, set of fields, this data flow and cost fields. And in, in all reality, we use these uh, data flow and cost fields to actually compute a set of data flow statistic and a set of cost statistics, which are uh, in some ways independent of the actual execution itself. Right? So data flow statistics are things, uh, represent statistics over the data, like what was the selectivity of the user-defined map function in terms of records? What was the compression ratio that we're able to achieve. And then cost statistics are statistics, things like what was the average I.O. cost from reading from local disk? Or what was the average CPU cost for processing the user-defined map function? Now, by using this data flow and cost statistics, we can actually uh, predict how uh, MapReduce jobs are going to behave in different settings. And like I said, that is done by the what-if engine. So the what-if engine can actually predict you know, the hypothetical changes on data, cluster resources, and configuration settings uh, on, the, the programs, on the program execution. Okay. So the job profile uh, can be given to the what-if engine to estimate how the job will behave. And that's all it needs uh, in terms of the program itself. Right? So we're able to completely abstract away the, the uh, user-defined map and reduce program into this job profile. Now, when we want to ask a hypothetical question to the what if engine, there are three more inputs that are required. Right? So we need to specify uh, you know, the full, essentially, scenario. I want to run this particular job represented by this job profile over a particular, over a new input data set on a perhaps different cluster resources and use perhaps different configuration settings. Now, any of these three could actually be hypothetical. So these four inputs will go through the what-if engine and out will come the properties of the uh, hypothetical job. Now, the what-if engine works uh, in two steps. The first step is taken by the virtual profile estimator. Now this component is responsible for estimating what we call a virtual job profile. This is the profile that we would have observed if we were to run this job on this particular settings. Right. Then this virtual job profile is going to be used by by our task scheduler simulator that will simulate uh, the scheduling and execution of individual map and reduce tasks on the cluster in order to get an understanding of the full execution of the map reduce job. And when I say the full execution, I really mean uh, a description of how each and every map and reduce task is going to behave. And then we can actually use that information to visualize any of the screenshots that I showed earlier about the histograms, the, uh, 
the timeline of execution, etc., we can actually visualize all of that by the output of the what if engine. Now, of course, the most critical component of all here is this virtual profile estimator. Right? So the goal of the virtual profile estimator is the following. Given a profile that we have observed for a particular program on some input data, some cluster resources, and some configuration settings, we want to estimate what the virtual profile will be for the hypothetical job in different data properties, different cluster resources, and different configuration settings. Now, what you're going to see in this one slide here, it's actually about one year worth of work, give or take, that I tried to summarize in a, in a single slide. Uh, so estimating, you know, making this estimation essentially involves estimating the individual uh, categories that comprise you know, these MapReduce job profiles. So we want to estimate the data flow statistics, the cost statistics, data flow, and cost information for these virtual profiles. Now, these uh, categories represent, you know, of course, very different information. And therefore, I uh, decided to use different modeling techniques to model uh, these different categories. For estimating data flow statistics for the virtual profile, right, all we need to do is we look at the data flow statistics that we have observed uh, and combine it with the current input data that we're asking the hypothetical uh, option of. And then we use some traditional cardinality models, good old you know, database style cardinality models, to estimate the data flow statistics of the virtual profile. Now, when it comes to cost statistics, right, these are, like I said earlier, this is information that's very well connected to the, the machine specification. Right? We're talking about I.O. cost or CPU cost. So if the cluster resources, the hypothetical or the new cluster resources are different, now we need to translate these cost statistics that we have observed on you know, one cluster into the cost statistics that we expect to observe on the new cluster. So for this purpose, I use a set of relative black box model. This is machine learning models, essentially, to actually make this translation. And then uh, when it comes to data flow and costs, these are specific in some ways on how Hadoop behaves. So for this, uh, I, I came up with a set of white box models. Uh, that is, these are analytical models, literally a set of mathematical equations that explain how individual map and reduce tasks will behave in terms of data flow and costs. Uh, and this information here, the, uh, the analytical box models, uh, it's about 16 pages of math that are available in a, in a technical report. Uh, and a lot of the other things are described in, uh, in this paper uh, that I presented in SOC earlier. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of details hidden behind this slide. And of course, I definitely don't have any time to go into any of this. So I've decided to only go a little bit into these relative black box models, these machine learning models that we use um, to make estimations across different clusters. Right? So imagine that we have you know, a blue cluster and a red cluster, that they have perhaps different types of nodes, different number of nodes, you know, Thing about this could be the production cluster and the, the, devel the development cluster and the red would be the production cluster, for example, mm -hmm. right? So we, we run and profile the job on the blue cluster. We collect the job profiling information, <clears throat> and then we get the cost statistics of this particular job running on the blue cluster, right? So we have this you know, set of numbers, essentially, to represent the cost statistics. Now, our goal is to figure out what the cost statistics will be for this job once we run it on the red cluster. Now, in order to be able to make this uh, translation, if you like, or this prediction, uh, we essentially need to collect information about how would a job behave in these two different clusters, right? So in any typical, you know, in many, typical uh, machine learning algorithms, we need some training data. And this training data will come after running uh, a set of training jobs 
uh, very carefully chosen set, customly, customly implemented set of training jobs that will run in both of these clusters to collect uh, essentially cost statistics, right? Different jobs will behave differently. We have CPU intensive jobs, IO intensive jobs, et cetera. We run them on both clusters. So we uh, collect these cost statistics for different scenarios. And then we're going to use those informations to build uh, a machine learning model. Uh, here, pretty much any supervised learning uh, algorithm would work. After playing with uh, a few, I decided to use something called an M5 model tree. Uh, think about this as a decision tree where at the, uh, at the uh, leaves, you have small uh, regression models uh, to capture the, the trends. So these models can then be used to translate cost statistics from the blue cluster into cost statistics in the red cluster. All right. And then the final component, the job optimizer, uh, can be used to figure out what's the best configuration settings to use for running a particular MapReduce job uh, over perhaps different input data and different cluster resources. Uh, again, the job optimizer follows two steps. The first is to enumerate the entire search space and try to figure out if there are uh, any independent subspaces that we can cut our space into. And then for each one of those independent subspaces, now we need to search through this space. Now this space is essentially represented uh, by that f function that I showed very, very early on and implemented by the what if engine. Uh, so for this, of course, you know, it's a, it's a, the, the function itself, it's, it's black box, it's non-model, it doesn't behave in any uh, well-known way. Uh, so we ended up, I ended up implementing this method called recursive random search that's responsible for searching through the space. And as it searches through the space for the different points in the space, it will make appropriate what if calls to figure out what the cost will be for, execute, uh, for executing the job uh, in the cluster at that particular point. Can yes? The previous that one right, so the training jobs. Right. Uh, so the each job is, uh, corresponds to a certain program P, right? Mm -hmm. now, in order to do a prediction for program P, Mm -hmm. You need to train also on executions, previous executions of the program P, or could you train on completely different programs? Uh, in other words, do you support ad hoc jobs? Right, right, right. So that's, that's a very good question. And that there's actually a lot of details that go into how do we come up with these training jobs. Uh, one thing you could do is say, OK, so you know what your workload looks like. So we could take a sample of that workload, or even the entire workload uh, that you know, and then run it on both clusters, observe, and then build that information. Uh, that, that would definitely work. The problem with that is now if you have a new job that come in that behaves differently, uh, if you don't have the training data, if you haven't observed the training data, then the machine learning model is not going to work very well. Right? So for that reason, we did not follow that approach. Right? So if we take a step back and, figure, and think about what do we need here, we need to predict how cost statistics will behave. Right? So how these numbers uh, relate going from the blue cluster to the red cluster. So the goal of the, these training jobs is in some ways to generate data that will cover this prediction space that consists of all the different range of values that the different cost statistics can take. So for this purpose, I actually uh, implemented a set of custom MapReduce jobs that they don't do anything useful to the user, but they exercise, uh, they actually run map and reduce tasks that behave very differently in order to capture as much of that prediction space as possible. So that any job that will come in, existing job or new job, uh, will be very likely to uh, have cost statistics that will fall into the training data that we have collected. Right. All right. Now, you said until 11.40. 10 minutes? Oh, OK, there's plenty of time for that. OK. All right. 
uh, since I've only left now with experimental valuation uh, is, is the main section. Uh, so for the experimental valuation, like I said, it's essentially uh, evaluating the different functionalities of Starfish that I have uh, presented so far. Uh, so let me start from the, uh, the profiling itself. Like I said earlier, if we turn it off, we have zero overhead. But if we turn it on, uh, we do get some overhead. Uh, and the, uh, the tool that I ended up using turned out to have a little more overhead than I uh, would like it, I guess. So I didn't mention this earlier. So I used this tool called Btrace to actually implement the, uh, uh, the profiler into. Uh, so what you see in these this two graphs is I wanted to show this uh, cost-benefit, uh, these trade-offs between the overhead and the benefit we can get from uh, the profiling. So the first graph shows the percent overhead that is added to the job as we profile more and more tasks. As we see, we profile every single MapReduce uh, task. And in this case, by running this work occurrence uh, over 30 gigabytes of data, we have a few hundred map tasks that are running, uh, we can get up to almost 30% overhead, which is pretty significant. Uh, but, by only pro but when we start profiling only 5, 10, 20%, then the overhead that we observe is much, much lower, definitely more uh, appropriate. And then if we look at the graph on the right that shows what is the speed that we're able to achieve by using job profiles that were approximate job profiles that were built from you know, the different uh, percentage of the task profile, we see that profiling up to 10% of you know, tasks it's, will give us enough information to build a profile that's representative, that's pretty much the same profile as if we were to profile 100% of the tasks. Now, the uh, next uh, brief evaluation of the what if engine, of course, I did a lot more to evaluate the what if engine, but visually, visually the easiest way to observe is actually to uh, compare, essentially, the different surfaces that we can get. Uh, so on, on the left here, you see the actual surface that you saw earlier that shows the running time of this work occurrence program as it was run in different uh, uh, settings for these two configuration parameters. So I literally run this job, it was five times for 20 different times to get this particular graph. Now I used one of those settings, I profiled in one of those settings, and then used that job profile to ask to make 20 what if calls to the what if engine. And that generated the estimated surface on the right. So as you can see, you know, the what if I, I'm not going to claim that the two uh, surfaces are identical, of course, but what I will point out is how the what if engine is able to clearly capture all the execution trends uh, that results uh, from varying these two configuration parameters. We can clearly identify the blue regions and the red regions here and the different trends. Uh, and all this based on a single execution job on a single settings. Uh, then we have, uh, let's see, this, this graph uh, so shows the, uh, the running time of running these individual MapReduce jobs on the production cluster using settings, well, three different settings. One was using the rules of thumb settings. The second one, the, the red bar, was using the settings suggested by the Starfish optimizer based on the job profiles that we have observed on the development cluster, right, before running on the production cluster at all. So as we can see, in all cases, we're able to match or improve upon the execution running time of uh, the rules of thumb settings. Now, to see how much better we could have gone if instead of profiling on the development cluster, we were to profile on the production cluster, uh, I put there this green bar. So for the green bar, we actually profiled on the production cluster and then used that job profile to uh, get, good conf get the configuration settings to use uh, on the production cluster. Now, as you can see, in almost you know, every single case, 
uh, it didn't really matter whether the profile came from the development cluster or the, or the production cluster. We're still able to get uh, very, very good uh, performance uh, in both cases. And then finally, this portrays to the last scenario where uh, we can actually make predictions and recommendations with regards to the number of nodes to use or the type of nodes to use. So what you see in these two graphs is the running time on the top and the monetary cost on the bottom of running our MapReduce workload consists of all those MapReduce jobs. Right? So the blue bars shows the actual running time of the workload run on, let's see, these were 20 node clusters of different node types. Now the red bar shows the prediction uh, running time of the entire workload, again, on the different node types. And to get these predictions, we used the job profiles that were collected on a 10 node cluster of M1 dot large instances. And again, as you can see, we're still very, fairly accurate in predicting the running time as well as the monetary cost. And again, the important thing here was to actually capture you know, the trends and not the absolute uh, predictions. Okay. Uh, so finally, clearly there's, there's a lot of related work uh, around with Starfish. I just wanted to, I guess, uh, briefly mention some of uh, related work. There's definitely a lot of work being done on self-tuning of database systems with projects like Leo from IBM or AutoAdmin uh, here at Microsoft Research. So a little work on adaptive query processing where you change your execution plan, uh, plan at running time. Uh, now, in terms of optimizations at the MapReduce systems, uh, there's a lot of rule-based techniques that have been uh, implemented, uh, especially in the higher level systems like Hive or PIC, and I, or how to select good data layouts, so columnar storage papers are coming out, et cetera. And then finally, with, with regards to performance modeling, there's definitely a huge variety of papers for black box models, analytical models, simulations in the MapReduce systems and in different systems, et cetera. Right. So to summarize, Starfish is a system that is able to achieve good balance between ease of use and getting good performance automatically out of uh, a system, actually a whole ecosystem of systems uh, like Hadoop and all the different systems around it. And it focuses on tuning uh, at all sorts of different levels from job level to workflow level and uh, to cluster level. Uh, we have also released part of the, the Starfish code. So you can actually go on the website, you could download Starfish and you can play with it. You can use it to uh, visualize you know, the execution of MapReduce jobs. You can ask what if questions and you can optimize MapReduce jobs. And then in the next version, we're now adding, actually we've already added support for PIG and we're in the process of adding support for other higher level systems like Hive and Cascading. All right, and I guess at this point, I'll take any questions for the time we have left. Yes. I guess this, this might be a question that takes a little longer, but um, the, the one interesting thing is you, your choice between using what? Um, so sort of using machine learning for um, the cost mm -hmm. models um, and then using white box models for other parts. What right. motivated that? The, uh, I could summarize that in one line that I guess no size fits all would be the, the answer here. There's, there's so different, there are, the, the different things that I wanted to estimate were so different than using, let's see, where was that? Right. Using the, the same model for everything just didn't seem to be right. right. When we're trying to make predictions with regards to memory specification, to uh, hardware specifications, like we have different memory, different CPU architectures, you know, I, Representing that using white box analytical models would just almost be impossible, right? Or you would not be able to get good predictions out of it, right? Now, the other way around, right, if I were to use, I could have used machine learning models to capture 
some of the uh, to predict data flow and cost information, for example. However, these are far more complicated. There's a lot of interactions between them. So I would have to figure out uh, what all the different interactions and their prediction spaces are actually much larger. And then at the same time, there was no reason to do that because uh, we actually understand how Hadoop behaves. We can see how it behaves. We know exactly what's going on. Uh, we know the different rules that they follow for spilling and for sorting. Uh, so we can actually model all those things analytically. And if we can model things analytically, then we can actually get much better uh, predictions out of it. Right. So the, the clear motivation was figure out what's the best model that will give us the best predictions. So you sort of hinted at uh, earlier on in your talk that people are actually using Starfish or thinking about using Can you say more about who is using it and what is the feedback? Yes. Uh, so within academia itself, uh, Starfish has actually inspired a couple of new projects. There's a, a project that I know of at Waterloo and another one in um, Hong Kong University that there's starting to look at different ways to extend and use Starfish. Uh, now, in terms of the industry itself, I, I have been contacted. There are a couple of local companies at the Research Triangle area. And then I guess our biggest conne connection right now is uh, Zetaset. It's a company that commoditizes Hadoop and offers support for Hadoop. It's a competitor of Cloudera. Uh, that they've started to look into how to use Starfish, and maybe uh, we're actually looking into some collaborations, possible collaborations on how they can actually use Starfish in their product, and how we can actually uh, run Starfish in some real production clusters and production, real-world real uh, workloads and data. Right? Uh, and we have, well, of course, Yahoo as well. Now that we have support for PIG, the next thing to do is actually uh, give them Starfish so we can see how it behaves when it analyzes, again, real workloads expressed in a uh, pig Latin query. There's one more that I'm missing. Oh, and Horton works, of course. Uh, yeah, came out of Yahoo. Right. Yes? How much was it still left? I mean, that's some, uh, like, um, you know, say, adaptive query processing or just other techniques. Where, how much does this address? Right. Um, so as far as configuration settings is concerned, um, I really don't think there is much speed up left. But this is only one little slice, in some ways, of the optimization space. Uh, now, like I said, at the, I guess the very first uh, slide was I wanted to present the work that I did by myself. Right? So these are all the work that I have done. Now, at Duke, we're actually looking into a lot, you know, much larger picture of Starfish. Uh, in particular, right now, we're looking into how to, optim how to make different optimizations at the different levels of uh, workloads. Right? So if we have a workload that's expressed, let's say, in Hive or peak lighting, right? Now, there's a lot of different optimizations we could do there. And we actually broke it down into four different categories. Right? So we could do logical optimizations, you know, traditional join rearrangements, uh, push down selection, those kind of optimizations. Uh, of course, now we could do them in a cost-based fashion by using some of the, uh, the Starfish uh, capabilities here. The, uh, the second layer is physical operator selection. Now, if you have, you can implement the same logical operation in different ways. How do you select which one is better, right? Should I use my typical reduced site join versus a fragment replicate join, etc.? The third layer is how do we pack now these logical and physical operations into individual map-reduced jobs? Right? Uh, and there, there's a lot of possibilities for merging jobs together, sharing scans, sharing data transfers, uh, figuring out how to set up data layouts or partition the data in particular ways, such that uh, you know, jobs that come later on to read the data actually benefit from there. So there's a lot of work there. Actually, this is work I'm working on right now, 
uh, with another PhD student back at Duke. And then the fourth level is the, you know, the parameter space level, which is what this uh, presentation was focused on. Uh, by the way, so if you look at the entire stack, there's a lot of optimization opportunities and a lot of speed up that you can get. Thank you.